really important panel, and we have some amazing experts who I'll introduce in one second. But I just want to point out the fact that I think, think it's really important to look at both the positive and negatives of this technology and not just fall into the trap of only thinking there are positives, like some people do, or only thinking it's negatives, and also not catastrophizing, right? There's a well-known uh, tendency of the brain, the human brain, to go to the worst case scenario. Um, so what we're gonna try and do is a really balanced, looking at both the positives and negatives of this technology, which will be disruptive uh, in both good and bad and unpredictable ways. So uh, joining us uh, is an amazing panel. Um, first, we have uh, Professor Martha Palmer, who's a professor of computer science and professor of distinguished for linguistics at the University of Colorado in Boulder and has a rich history in working in exactly this area of natural language processing and understanding. Um, next, we have uh, Eliana Kulanga, who is an associate professor at uh, here at the University of Colorado Boulder, and also somebody who's uh, spent a lot of time thinking about these issues. And last, but definitely not least, is Orly Lobel, who is the Warren Distinguished Professor of Law and Director of the Center of Employment and Labor Policy at the University of San Diego. Um, and it just came out not that long ago with an amazing uh, book on AI and policy and governance generally called the Equality Machine, which I highly recommend. So uh, let me dive right in uh, for our first question here, and I'll pose this to Orly and then open it up to the rest of the panel. Um, so Orly, what, what are some ways that you think of large language models and these new generative technologies like GPT-4 more broadly in terms of creating improvements for society? Yeah, well, thanks. So first, that's you know a really big question. Um, and what you said at the outset, I think is really important to, to look at uh, potential and risks at the same time. And, and even more importantly, to try to envision the potential. So, uh, you know, just not kind of take it as a given. Um, so I think throughout the day, we've already heard um, about a lot of great uses. We talked uh, most specifically about access to justice and um, you know, looking at law tech, uh, thinking most of us probably in the room are attorneys thinking about how uh, some human functions uh, can certainly be replaced uh, by generative AI where um, the more, uh, certainly the more mundane, um, the functions can can be taken away and uh, perhaps give us more time for creativity and more time in general. Um, but also just thinking about all the people who can't pay the cost of um, attorneys, can't pay the cost of medicine. So there were other examples, I think, given throughout the day about um, uh, healthcare uh, radiologists, uh, bots that are performing surgery. There's so many different uses. And one of the things that I want to say at the outset that has been important for me in my research is that when we, when you ask me, like, what is the potential? What are the, the good uses? What I always want us to think about is a comparative advantage. Um, I see a lot when we're talking about chat GPT and its flaws um, or any other um, in program that uses AI, I see a lot of kind of this double standard where there's an expectation of perfection from the machine um, rather than asking, is it an improvement? Is it outperforming what we have now? So I think the most intuitive one, like example would be um, a self-driving car, an autonomous vehicle where you see the media reporting, oh, you know, there's, it got into an accident, so it's unsafe. And of course the question is, is it safer? And so si similar um, in a lot of fields, specifically in the field that I work in the most, um, uh, and, and there I think there's already so much use uh, with uh, AI, is uh, in hiring, there's a lot of talk about AI bias and you know what, what are the outcomes when you tell a, um, a software to do all kinds of resume parsing, um, you know, applicant sorting, video interviewing, facial recognition, emotional recognition. There are lots of technologies. 
And uh, there is a fear that there's going to be disparate outcomes. Um, and again, the, the right question always to ask is, is it better, can it do better than the human biases that we already have? I mean, we have a history of a lot of exclusions uh, everywhere, but again, specifically, I, I studied the labor market and how hiring happens and how networks are closed and, and very skewed in a lot of ways and professionally. So I think the potential there is really to um, look for underserved talent, undervalued talent, and to be more inclusive. Yeah, that, that's a really important point. And I and just want to emphasize the idea of always comparing it to what we have today. So it turns out that humans also make up facts, not just exactly. large language models, right? And humans have biases. And if you have an error in a legal document, humans make errors too. So yeah, those are some great comments. Let me throw it out to the rest of the panel on some of these positive benefits. Do you want other possible, possible benefits? Yeah, for, for now, then we'll stay. look to the other side. Uh, Yeah, go ahead. Um, okay. Um, so I, you know, certainly like all of the things that you suggested. Um, one of the areas I've been working in more recently is uh, education and sort of trying to put an AI partner in a classroom with students. And um, the more I'm learning about GPT-4, the more excited I can get about the potential for how it could just transform learning experiences. Mm -hmm. Um, so it was a, a kind of a vision that we've had in the field for at least 20 years or more now is being able to take, you know, a good textbook that is written for a particular t kind of student and take that material and make it either uh, make the vocabulary either simpler and more accessible or possibly make it a bit more sophisticated for an older student or make the material have more images and less text, or less images and more text, or even potentially translated into another language. Uh, and as far as I can tell, GPT-4 should be able to do all of that. Now, it's not gonna be able to do it immediately, and it would, you know, we'd have to get some funding from somebody to you know, work on it and figure out how to make that happen. Um, it could, you know, easily turn the books into audiobooks, for instance, you know. So, so there's just a, there's a wonderful potential there to, to just take any particular type of, of, of informative document and just produce all these different versions of it that could, you know, you could, you could ask, you know, people could say, I want this same information, but I, you know, I want it in Spanish or I want it in, you know, almost all visual and very little text. Uh, and then, and that, and that could really uh, improve people's learning experiences. And you could have tutors, and again, we're not there at the moment, it would take a bit of tinkering, but you know, you could have sort of uh, personalized to math tutors and chemistry tutors and foreign language tutors and um, you, just any subject you can think of that could be one-on-one -on -one with a student and you know, meet them right where they are, answer their questions, and, and give them new material and new challenges that are you know, perfectly suited for the level that they have. So- Orly, did you want to respond yeah, to that? Yeah, no, I, I, I love that example. I, I actually, uh, in, in the book, In the Equality Machine, I, I look at tutors in schools. And again, this is a, a, an issue of access. Uh, I know that, um, there's a lot of resistance. Uh, I've heard, I've been in debates with the ACLU saying, oh, you know, these companies are giving free um, laptops or free iPads to schools. It's just, you know, they're just going to try to extract the data. And, but, but really what we're seeing is, um, especially when it's coming out of academia, like people like you who are working on these projects. I, I looked at a project out of MIT that's looking at social robots. So these are um, you know, like fuzzy uh, humanoid robots that have the, the, you know, before GPT, but they have uh, some degrees of machine learning in them uh, and, and ability to personalize. They, they use uh, facial recognition and, and they kind of 
do exactly what you're saying, but also um, they model fallibility and they model um, like learning in ways that the teachers that are strapped for resources, they're, you know, they have so many students and, and so little time, they just can't do that. And so the way that you presented it as tutors, uh, again, a lot of times we think, and we, I know that we're going to talk about this in the panel, like, are we going to be replaced? versus are we going to be aided in our work? And, and that's what I try to suggest with attorneys as well. Um, and, and we certainly can see this happening with teachers. I think that what we really need to think about is how our, our own work can be enhanced, can be helped rather than uh, you know, supported and, and the goals achieved rather than just thinking about it as like replacing teachers. Yeah, great, great point, I think. Uh, I think its ability to really impact and improve education and the visions you both spelled out are going to be really important. Um, you, you can also get it to explain a complicated academic paper to you, you know, like you're talking to an eighth grader, and it'll do a good job taking a paper that at least I couldn't read and then explaining it to me in uh, really understandable terms. And I think this can democratize knowledge to people. It's going to revolutionize research, um, I think, in important ways. Ileana. Yeah, I think personalization is, is a really, um, a, a really uh, encouraging thing that it could do. I think, it, I think it is very exciting, the possibilities there. Some of the stuff that we are working on in my lab is precisely on uh, adapting things for like, tiny little toddlers. And, and so there's that thing about like hitting the right level of explaining information to different groups of people. Um, but there's also other types of personalization that you can imagine having, right? So maybe you want your audiobook read by Kanye West, <laughs> right? Or maybe, maybe uh, you know, a child who is really into one specific topic can learn about a concept within that specific topic that they find already interesting and, eng and engaging. So I think the possibilities are endless. I also think in terms of bias, one of the things that these models, I mean, language model, large language models, but just like large models uh, do very well is take vast amounts of information and integrate them in a way that makes sense. And so you could see using this type of model as a way to catch bias, mm -hmm. as a way to self-monitor, but not just monitor the models, but also just monitor what is going on and pinpoint areas where bias might be um, interfering with the process. That, that's a really important point. I think this technology can be used to detect latent biases that we haven't seen before and help improve in those areas. I really like that idea. Do, do you want to ha have a follow-up, Martha? Can yeah. I, Go, can I okay. offer a, a, a less profound potential benefit of, of GPT-4? This is one of my personal favorites because I've just spent the last six months trying to shift from Comcast TV and phone and internet to CenturyLink. And, and I am now a veteran of at least 30 hours of online chats and phone, you know, service, service outsourced service centers. <laughs> think, think, imagine having an online chat that actually worked. <laughs> wow. That in five minutes would solve your problem. <laughs> and that's totally something that these things could do. That is so, a great point. That alone could improve national happiness by 10%. <laughs> Um, okay, so we've heard a lot of positive views, but we also want to look into the uh, negative aspects. So let me uh, start with Eliana. What are some of the risks that you see in terms of disruption in society of this powerful new technology? Yeah, so I want to say like straight out from the onset that I'm not going to talk about super intelligent AI deciding that the world is better off without humans and poisoning all of our water sources or anything like that. I, I don't think that is catastrophizing. I think that's going beyond. I think that's a silly idea. We can talk about that more if you want to. Um, I think a lot of the risks and the 
yeah, the pitfalls of this technology come from sort of misunderstandings about how computers work, misunderstandings about how AI works, and misunderstandings about how people work. And so there's a lot of things that are problematic right now, given the way things are. But there's no reason why things have to stay that way. And so I, I want to highlight two potential issues. And I'm highlighting them because these are already existing problems. And so I, I think they can be made worse with this technology. But I also think they can be helped. They can be ameliorated, maybe corrected with this technology. And so I kind of cheated oh, in my I, I like assignment. It. But I, I, um, I'm just an optimist. Yeah. And so um, one of them has to do with the homogenization of language. And not just language, but language <laughs> Language is just more than just words or just sentences, right? Language is uh, stories. Language is culture. Uh, we transmit our values and our culture through language. Um, and we codify it in language. So language is, goes beyond uh, that. And let me give you a concrete example of the sort of thing that I'm talking about. Um, so a few years ago, I was at a workshop organized by the Head Started Network. It's, um, they work on kind of like um, innovation and technology in the early childhood development and education. And so they're kind of affiliated with Head Start. Uh, they're not, sorry, they're not affiliated with Head Start, but they have the, they work together sometimes and they have the same goal of uh, positively impacting uh, the lives of, of vulnerable young children. And so this workshop was on trying to develop principles for ethical use of AI in this particular domain. And so one of the use cases that we were discussing was let's have AI just basically listening to everything children say. And these are tiny, right? These are preschoolers. They're not going to be talking to, about anything that could get them in trouble. So it's, it's not a privacy thing. But basically, we can use this to build normative models of what language and cognition should you know, what are the stages that it should, how it should proceed. And then when a child deviates from that, we flag them for intervention. And that's really scary. Um, that's really scary because there are different ways to get at the same place. There are a lot of variants of language and there are different ways of speaking and developing that are all acceptable and should be embraced and celebrated. And so when you have the model as one standard way, as the ideal, then it becomes really problematic. This is a problem that already exists. And we already use standardized tests for this purpose. So it's not something that AI would introduce, but it's something that AI could make worse. And I think because of the way we misunderstood AI as being objective and perfect and things like that, I think, you know, it, it's uh, potentially a problem. The second thing I want to highlight is the devaluing of human labor. And again, we already do this, right? So every time I see one of those videos of someone expertly, you know, harvesting produce or cooking, I just want to scream, unskilled labor what? Like this is not unskilled, right? You try to do it. I know I couldn't. And so we already do that. And I think we're all kind of excited about a future in which repetitive, boring, manual labor is not 
around anymore. I know personally, I don't want to pick up any more socks off my floor. That'd be great. <laughs> we had a sock picker upper. Um, but the real, like people start getting worried when it's like doctors are getting replaced, lawyers are getting replaced, scientists are getting replaced. And so I think, again, this is a problem that already exists. And I think we need to make a thoughtful, conscious decision of how we want to spend our time. That is, that is what matters here, right? Like, how do we want to spend our time? And what do we want our tools, the tools that we are designing and creating to help us spend the time the way we want to? Maybe it is making cat videos. That's fine. You'll find your bliss. <laughs> but, you know, we can just be thoughtful about it. Wow. Those are really two profound points, just to summarize. Your, your first point was really interesting because there might be this tendency to collapse nuance and context and take all the shades of gray and have AI collapse it into one automated standard. And that's not necessarily a good thing. We, we heard this in the last panel version of why can't AI just decide, you know, fair use or something like that? So I think it's going to be, we're going to have to be something we're on guard about that we don't, uh, in the race to efficiency and certainty, we lose some of uh, the broad spectrum of humanity and human nature. So that was a really good point. Love that. The, the second point I think you said, which is also terrific, which is we should have always been caring about people whose livelihoods are being automated away not as a society, not just when it starts coming after, you know, knowledge workers and things like that. And I think you're absolutely right about that. Uh, let, me, let me throw the same question about risk out to the other panelists. Or Orly? Uh, yeah, I'm happy to follow up on that because um, I agree with Eliana's points and, and it's actually something that I've been thinking about quite a bit, uh, actually before, Exactly like you say, these are not new problems. Uh, well before we had um, chat GPT and we, before we had uh, you know, integration of uh, AI and so many different aspects of our production um, and before we had digital platforms. So there's a lot of this kind of um, spotlighting on Uber as uh, the gig economy replaced the like replacing full time employment and changing the nature of employment relations. Um, but the move to contingent work has been something that has been happening for decades. Um, and it did start with the kind of lower skill and, you know, moving up to every single job. Um, what I have argued in my research for a long time is that it's always been a political decision and an anomaly and a historical kind of path dependent um, decision to tie so much of our social welfare to work and to a single employer. Um, it has not been the case everywhere in the world, but it's very Americanized and so it's spread to Europe and you know other places. but. You know, uh, I think this is a real moment where we should question a lot of those assumptions that um, our uh, social security, our, our um, welfare, our health, uh, our reskilling uh, and uh, investment in human capital, our retirement, that all of those are tied to, you know, and also just uh, worker comp, all these things are tied to uh, the, like, what is our job right now defined as and 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 that's a very that's a completely political decision we've also um and it's a big piece of it we've also very much politically uh historically and now to, still today uh tax much more of labor than capital and so you know we are at a moment where um, it's kind of a perfect storm where these political arrangements that we had, um, now that they're getting more to the top, I think maybe it's like a moment where we can question them, you know, all the way down and think about issues of global 
justice and distribution. So these are like kind of big answers, you know, like, <laughs> well, let's change the system. But, but what I want to say, and Harry, you said that in a, in a nice way that it's like, you know, this, there's been all these cycles of automation, you know, like industrialization is also a cycle of automation. We're seeing it, you know, it may be at a different speed right now and in different scale and, and, um, and, and different kinds of jobs. But we've always had this, we talked about this in the copyright panel as well of like, you know, there's always the kind of the sky is going to fall, you know, there's not going to be this concept of work or creativity or, and, and it turns out that that's not, true, um, but it is true that we need to um, understand that it's not on technology to get it right, that we have values in a democratic society, that everybody has the right to human dignity and livelihood and, you know, to sustain um, their their lives and their well-being, and, and that's on the democratic process, uh, not on the technology. Absolutely. That's a great point. And then Part of what I, I think is reflected in there is in these technological trends, in the long term, often society adapts and new types of jobs are created that we couldn't even imagine. Like, you know, nobody could have imagined the computer game designer 100 years ago, right? Whereas human calculators were obsoleted by the computer. So in the long term, jobs don't go away, we figure it out. But in the short term, people, individuals are disrupted. They can't pay the bills. They can't be themselves or their family. And we as a society need to be sensitive to that and do something about it. We can't just not ignore that. I think that's a, a great point. Uh, Martha, did you want to weigh in? Well, that, that's a hard act to follow. <laughs> but I, I think there's one more point to, to make up. And I, we're sort of talking in kind of, I think, in general terms about the idea that GPT-4 could do away with a lot of kinds of different kinds of jobs. And that's certainly true. I mean, one of the, there's been a lot of talk about how good um, the programming is. And, and our computer science department here, the people who teach the introductory programming class are in dire straits because GPT-4 can get everything right on the final exam for the, you know, the programming class. And, and how do they you know, test the students in such a way that they can make sure they really know what they're talking about? Um, and, and, that's, and, and, and that's also going to be true in a lot of other areas, too, like um, editors, editorial assistants. Um, GPT-4 can do a great job of editing papers and finding grammatical errors and things like that. Uh, it, could write, it can write a lot of news stories, um, certainly reporting sports events or you know, some, some of the more prototypical things that happen. Um, and it, it, can, it can do a lot of patent search stuff and comparing patents and things like that. So you're talking about a lot of kind of uh, paralegal jobs, um, you know, entry level programming jobs, entry level, you know, the cub reporter jobs, the, um, the bottom of the ladder for the editor, you know, the editorial assistant jobs that, you know, this thing can do just fine. And that's a problem for those people who would have gotten those jobs and, and getting and them, you know, not being out of work, get, either getting laid off or not being able to get the jobs in the first place. But it's also a problem because at least right now, GPT-4 can do all the entry level stuff, but it's not doing the really challenging, sophisticated, creative programming that, you know, the things that haven't been written before. Um, it's, it's not doing, you know, the, the work of a really superb editor who takes the novel and helps the author restructure it to bring certain characters more into focus and make the plot tighter and, you know, more exciting. And um, it, it, it's not going to do the kind of investigative reporting that we still occasionally get, <laughs> maybe from the New York Times. I mean, so where are we going to find the, those the people with those skills, how are we going to train our, the next generation to do the, the more challenging level of those jobs if they're not starting at the entry level? And what's that going to do to our society if we don't have people who can program anymore and who can really improve somebody's writing? Um, you know, are we just going to let GPT-4 do all of it? <laughs> Wow, those are really interesting points. Any other follow-ups on that? 
All right, so just shifting gears, um, a little bit like the first panel, we're going to speculate, but only two to three years out. Um, so let me toss this over to Martha. I know you've uh, been studying this for a while. I'd love to hear your thoughts about where this technology is going. Well, I've sort of, I've already mentioned, you know, the education application, my online chat application and the programming, you know, it's, gonna, it's certainly going to be doing lots, lots of coding. And we all know that, you know, Bing and Google or Microsoft and Google are about to go, you know, head to head on who's going to have the best search engine that's going to be the most interactive and do the best summarization and, you know, allow you to most quickly hone your church search to exactly what you want it to. And I'm really looking forward to that. I think that's going to be a lot of fun for all of us. And, and that kind of tool, um, you know, and, and it, you know, it may, it may need again a little bit of tinkering, but it's going to be, could be just a fantastic boon to researchers everywhere, you know, for, to historians, to classicists, to um, political scientists, to economists, you know, I mean, the, the having sort of a really sophisticated search engine that has at its fingertips everything that you want it to have read with respect to your field, you know, could be a game changer. So, and there's, and there's another, um, but, the, but there's another sort of, um, there are a couple of other potential areas, and these are things that I think it probably could do, but I have a lot of reservations myself about whether or not we want it to do this. Um, so when uh, police spend a lot of time writing up reports about all of the interactions they have and everything that happens, um, theoretically, something like GPT-4, given the information about what they've been doing all day, and it's a lot of it's on camera anyway and recorded, could write those reports for them. When you meet with your doctor, the doctors spend a lot of time writing up, you know, the report of your visit. A lot of that is kind of semi-automated already. Um, again, GPT-4 could record the conversation and write that report. I mean, you'd want to have lots of... <laughs> guardrails around to make sure that the information is kept kept private. Um, I spent, I've spent a lot of time doing research with electronic patient records uh, and trying to get information about sort of a particular disease and a particular treatment and, you know, trying to do that automatically. Um, it could, it could, you know, certainly a lot of that could be automated too. There's a lot of issues around patient privacy that have to be taken into consideration. Uh, so, and, and again, there's a human element in the police interactions. There's a human element in the, your interactions with your doctor. Are we really ready to just hand that over carte blanche to uh, an AI and take out that human element? So that, I think that's kind of scary. And then there's a, <clears throat> we had a wonderful panel right before lunch about sort of talking about all the creative things that the, this technology can do. Certainly these, you know, it can produce, uh, it, can, it can write, produce songs by, it, with certain singers' personas. It can produce different kinds of images. It can write stories. And you could certainly have it, especially if it was working in tandem with somebody, you could get a whole bunch of Star Trek episodes where you, it might not write the whole thing, but you could ask it for a few plots. You could pick the one you liked the best. You could then ask it to rewrite a few parts of that and get it to do more detail and do more dialogue. And next thing you know, you'd have a whole episode of Star Trek. Um, that might put a lot of people out of work too. <laughs> people who are already having trouble getting jobs. Um, but there's a, a whole nother layer to this whole idea of having GPT-4 take over a huge part of sort of our cultural artifacts, the production of our cultural artifacts. Because uh, artists, to a large extent, observe the world and changes in the world and then try to bring them to our attention and help them understand the way that society is evolving in either good ways or bad ways. And, and those cultural artifacts that our artists create can also impact our culture and our society. They can change the way we look at things. Um, I was lucky enough to get to see Hamilton in Denver 
um, last year. And for me, that was a transformative event. I have, I felt like it really changed the way I looked at not just our colonial history, but at what, what it can be to be a musical about interactions between people. It was, it was really novel and creative. And okay, you could say to GPT-4, write a play about a colonial figure and use rap as the musical genre today. But I just don't think that that would have the same transformative effect that, that Hamilton has had on so many people or something like the movie Just Mercy. So if we end up relying on AI to create a lot of our culture, and, and of course the AI is to a certain extent just gonna be regurgitating the stuff it's already seeing, then how does our culture evolve? And what happens, you know, who, where do we get the insights into how the culture is evolving that help us understand what we're doing right and what we're doing wrong? Those are really good points. And one theme that's come out again is uh, maybe the worry that the humanity of a lot of processes, whether it's lawmaking or art or music making will uh, kind of be lost. And we were never at this moment before because previous versions of AI couldn't produce outputs that resembled the quality of human level outputs. And now I love your question, you know, just cause we can, should we like we should be at the moment we are thinking whether we should not just whether we can and i think it's a really important point uh, eliana yeah so i i really like how you highlighted the artifacts produced by humans and and how that impacts culture and 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 i think it connects to the the two um issues i pointed out before and how we can use one to solve the other, right? So hear me out. So if we have tools, there's a lot of things that are not accessible to me. I have visions of art that could be created, but not the skill to make them. I could make that happen with the right AI support. Right? And so now you, a human could use something with maybe very little training, but with the right AI support. And then if we, there's nothing sacred or preordained about a 40 hour work week. So with our extra time, maybe we have more time to consume these lovely creative products to produce these, these wonderful creations with the help of AI. So I think, you know, I'm just envisioning a utopia now. Yeah, I, I love that point. I think in the early days of the internet, uh, people, it was a top-down process where companies gave stuff to people and then along came user generated content around 2005 and it was because they unlocked all these tools that weren't previously available and people were able to go up on YouTube and be you know an instructor or what have you so I love that idea of unlocking the creators in all of us yeah, Orly yeah no that's a great segue um, so I, I'll put on my law professor hat when you ask about the next two to three years. Uh, I think it will be really critical to think about the role of policy um, and you know, following up on, you know, kind of the how do we get to the better uh, kind of scenarios versus the, the worst ones. Um, I think it doesn't just happen. It happens through uh, a policy process, a collaborative public private, you know, kind of redirection of some things. Um, I want to plug that. We do, I, I think it was mentioned in the first panel that you know, like we, we would want a public option in some way of um, these technologies so that what Harry you know, describes as you know, the user generated stuff, the democratization of um, the, the creativity process, the, um, the invention process you know, is, is accessible. And I think about that a lot. I, so I actually don't know enough, um, but I've been in this conversation now of what is the end goal of some of these, um, you know, companies that are at the frontier of you know, like Microsoft, Google, OpenAI, what, what is their end goal when they're putting out generative AI 
um, applications. And the way it's been explained to me, I was just in conversation with somebody from Qualcomm and they were analogizing their technology that was basically chips that went into every other, you know, like tech company that needed to use that. And, and they, that, that was like how they kind of standardized and, and um, it was a B2B model. The, the argument is that this is where the, the money will be and the, the goal is to basically replace with generative AI technologies, replace the app store as it is today and have these like new platforms basically of application where you'll have these, you ha you'll have the technology itself or, or the chat embedded in all these other uses um, that we've already actually heard in some way, like case decks and, and others. And, and um, what that means is that we really need to pay attention to new forms of monopolies or, or anti-competitive like structures um, and think about like what are the frontiers of antitrust these are big questions but I think again in this context of you know law school and attorneys thinking about these things I think that that will be really important in the next few years um, I'll just add that uh, you know there's I, I think there's a lot of room and again this is what I want to see my wish list in the next few years and this is what I I feel like I've been arguing against um, a tunnel vision of government where they're so focused on risks of AI that um, it's been stagnating kind of the, um, the engagement and the integration, the deployment of existing technology for good um, and specifically in the work of government. So you mentioned um, you know, like police reports um, and using uh, generative AI to, to alleviate some of that. I actually think this is the game changer that it's always been the case that like private industry was, you know, is always ahead. Um, and uh, government, like regulation, policing, um, law enforcement, monitoring, compliance, um, administrative agencies, they're always playing catch up. Um, we actually do have the data. I was just looking at it. I, some of my research, my earlier research has been about um, occupational safety and health. And I had written about how OSHA is so strapped for resources. It like basically has no real threat you know, to, to companies. There's laws on the books, but companies don't really care about like they, they're not going to be inspected. And they're now like evidence, empirical evidence that if they were earlier... Um, or like if they were even adopting machine learning to just decide where to, you know, put their weight, where to have not just like random surprise inspections, but actual inspection, it would be, um, that would be the game changer in terms of, uh, of course, uh, less injury, less lives lost, but also just, uh, you know, public resources and costs, uh, savings and, 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 and the savings uh, of, for businesses too of, of billions. Um, I think that's really something that every function of, so it's not just law enforcement, policing, and it's not just um, adjudication, which is also something that's really important, but in every um, turn, uh, like I, I've written in, in the equality machine about um, fighting trafficking and missing children. And um, an area that's near and dear to my heart is consumer protection and employment protection when there's all these like unenforceable clauses in contracts. So rather than just thinking, oh, chat GPT can draft a contract, um, also think about the FTC being able to use these technologies to detect unenforceable uh, like boilerplate clauses across the board and, and you know, for so many industries and, and companies. Again, that, that will be the game changer, I think, to match up the super powers now that companies are using and their marketing and their like, you know, for-profit activities to match that up with um, public capabilities in law enforcement. Yeah, there, those are really great points. I mean, this is opportunity to make the government side operate, you know, much more effectively yeah, that's than That's very ever. utopian. <laughs> yes. Uh, yeah. You said that out loud. I'm like, uh, well, yeah. we do that. Yeah, yeah but there, I mean, <laughs> there's the opportunity, and we'll talk about that 
shortly. But uh, one, one thing we've heard is a lot of anxiety about the future. And as uh, Viva brought up in the last panel, it, this always happens when we have a new technology that comes around. People worried about the photocopying machine destroying everything or the VCR. And we've seen in the past, you know, the internet, car, electricity, social media. So there's always uh, this worry. So I, I wonder what can we learn from concerns of the past when a new technology has come along. And I heard this commentary from the journalist Ezra Klein, which I thought was pretty profound. And he said, uh, think back to 1990. And then you say to somebody, look what's going to happen. In 15 years, you can access all the world's information because of this thing called the internet. Information that used to take you days to find in the library, you can now find for second, you know, seconds. You'll be able to communicate with anyone across the world for free, you will be able to collaborate. Uh, all the world's research will be available to you. And by the way, it'll all be in a supercomputer in your pocket, right? And you're like, that's crazy. But half the world in 2005 would have said, this is gonna be this utopia. You know, uh, by 2005, we won't be working. We'll be in 20 hour work weeks. We'll have solved every disease. And then some other people would have said, oh no, this global reach is gonna allow, you know, these hostile people to come and pry into our lives and ruin it. And a little bit of both this happened, to be honest, but neither have we veered to the utopia nor the dystopia. And so let me throw this out to the panel. What, what can we learn from past interactions with major technological change? Uh, Eliana. I think systems have a way of self-perpetuating, right? So I think dramatic radical change is really hard because people don't want that in general and specifically people in power would not want that. And guess what? They have the power. So, so I think that's, that's one reason you don't see <laughs> the utopia. So I think what we should do is threaten politicians, jobs with AI. So we should <laughs> all just, give in to the doomsday scenario where we have an AI overlord. And then let's see if there's some change in that. <laughs> I, I don't yeah, think the uh, AI could make up facts Elena, can enough. I ask you actually, because um, you said that we can ask you about this. Um, and and I, I would love for you to hear your response to this, because I, I've been really frustrated with that real doomsday scenario of like the strawberry fields, uh, like, you know, tell a, a bot to, uh, produce as many sorry feels and then they're gonna kill all of us or you know other kinds of uh, analogies but what what is your response to that I, you said it's silly and I agree but yeah. I think it's silly I think it's I think it's a doomsday scenario that is very cultural specific yes. and I think it is based on what we envision uh, like I am smart a person who is smarter than me is just like me, but more so. And then, so you have people, like I literally <laughs> saw a thinker, what, what does he call himself? Anyway, I won't name names, but anyway, he really put this scenario about, about developing this thing that's gonna kill everyone and put it in the water supply and um, thereby killing ev everyone. And then he added, that's what I would do. To which I should, like, what? No, no, nobody should say that unless they're in some list. Uh, yeah. yeah, that's not normal. And so why do we imagine that something that is super intelligent is going to want to dominate and destroy. That's like a very colonizer point of view. That's not the only way of existing. You could be, you could have like a super nurturing ideal instead. <laughs> you should, you can have the most intelligent being in the world just wants everyone to be happy and get along and make cat videos, right? Like it doesn't have to be destroy and control. That, that's a very, so I, I think it just goes with a way of thinking about what intelligence is and about what power is for. And not everyone wants power for that reason. And not like not everyone wants power. And so, um, 
So yeah, that's uh, that's super answer. interesting. For, uh, you know, in, in my research, I actually I, I did kind of compare um, why the Japanese and um, Koreans. I'm, I'm heading to Tokyo actually on Monday, um, and I'm a G7 representative to their. Um, digital transformation, reporting to the World Economic Forum, and it was really rewarding to see how, in 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 my research for for my book, I actually said that you know the, the Japanese have a very different historical relationship with uh, technology, thinking about it as help, like bringing it into their homes and kind of a savior, helping the family, helping gender relations, and and kind of. Uh, folding uh, laundry and, and uh, putting diapers on, on kids and teaching them and nurturing them and, um, and just kind of being a, a companion. And uh, whereas we have Hollywood that shows us, you know, like the, the killer robot. Um, and there's lots of reasons for this kind of culturally, even like spiritually religion. Uh, and of course, you know, you can't talk without, like, these are like very flat kind of, uh, uh, too strong distinctions, but but there is something to it where we see um, the policies that are coming out of these governments reflecting that, like the EU is all about like privacy and stopping things, uh, and 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 I think the American um, reforms are very kind of individual rights and not kind of thinking about the distributive justice. So having kind of this anti-discrimination, again, this is kind of something that's near and dear to my heart of in the employment context, we think about equality as anti-discrimination rather than substantive equality of like actually, you know, redistributing resources and making sure that there's like here, it's called this bad name of uh, um, affirmative action, you know, like it's before the Supreme Court. If it's, it's even lawful, but you know, equality means that people get to be part of the the conversation. So, I absolutely subscribe to everything that you said. That we have these kind of cultural, um, you know, preconceived ideas about like if we're designing something that's super intelligent, will it have you know all these qualities that we associate with governing? Um, and, and, and that's very specific. Um, I would say on that though, um, that one of the things that, again, I think as a response is a responsibility of, um, the public of the public conversation of the media, um, and also, you know, just the government is to not only look at whether AI is trustworthy, whether, um, like technologies that like generative AI is uh, where are the flaws and you know how do we redesign it? But actually also thinking about the human machine interaction and thinking about rationalities in the way that humans understand your machines themselves. Um, so I mean, all of us, I think talked uh, about how there are capabilities these days that are clearly already outperforming human um, functions. Um, and it turns out that even when they are there, there's a lot of mistrust. Um, and that's to like, that is also a cost. Uh, if, if like a physician is getting a recommendation for treatment, um, and it, they are told, this is experimental research that shows us, they're told that it was an AI that recommended it. They're more likely to override that, to insert themselves as the human in the loop, you know, as, as we say. Um, that's problematic because it, it can actually be like, uh, you know, the opposite of life saving. It can be, uh, uh, it can mean uh, worse treatment. Uh, so, so we need to think about ourselves, you know, how we think rationally, not just uh, about having the best AI that we can. Yeah. Great. Those are all uh, terrific points. Uh, and before we open it up to questions, let me ask just a quick question, and this was really inspired by Orly's book. Uh, we are not passive recipients of a predetermined technological future. So what active steps can all of us in this room uh, do to, to shape the future that we want to see with AI? And I'll throw it out to Orly. No, yeah, I, I'm, I'm smiling because, uh, of course, I want everybody to, to read my book, but I also uh, want to say that Harry 
um, was one of the reviewers of the book in a recent symposium that the Yale uh, Journal of Regulation uh, held. And, and you can find his article online, uh, which is, to, what do you remember the title, the exact title of the? Uh, something about cognitive bias. Or, yeah. I don't remember yeah. <laughs> my so own article. It, it's, Ask GPT. <laughs> Ask GPD, yeah, 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 but but it it was ex exactly on these points and really uh, excellent. Uh, so, um, yeah, I mean, I, I, let's let's get other comments. <laughs> I think um, I think one thing I I don't know how much we can do this as individuals, but I think the solution or a, we can go a long way by basically adding diversity at all levels. So not just who is creating these technologies, but who is dreaming them up, who is involved in the process of making decisions, who is testing them, who can have access to them, who are they used on? Like all of these things need to be distributed over more people. And so I think, you know, of um, issues of, of participatory research, participatory work. And I think that, that insight of how bringing, bringing to the table everyone who could possibly be impacted by it at every level of the process, I think is really important. That's a great point. Martha, did you? Yeah, um, so one of the things that became really clear under COVID when all the schools went online was how much easier it was for certain households to immediately get their kids online and on an iPad and doing homeschooling versus other households that didn't have internet access, didn't have the devices at home, didn't. You know, and the, the Denver Public Schools made a point of making sure that every Denver um, household that had a school, a child in school, got an iPad. So that, you know, I mean, they, they put a lot of effort into trying to make it as accessible as possible. And I think what I, one of the things that I worry about with all of these advances is that it's just going to exacerbate the divide that we already have between the people who have easy access to all of this. Uh, and the people who don't in this country, but just all around the world. So I don't know. I mean, if there's some way, just like, so Boulder's been trying to, you know, get this thing going where anybody who's doing any new building in town, even the commercial buildings, they have to put aside a certain amount of money for um, affordable housing because of that we have so much trouble here with not having enough affordable housing. I'd love it if we could somehow get Microsoft and Google when they're in the middle of their, you know, fighting to, to somehow have to provide a certain percentage of the profits that they will surely make to make this as widely accessible as possible. But, and maybe we can demand that. Maybe we can, you know, make that, you know, such a publicly important issue that they'll, they won't have any choice. And, and perhaps this is too an obvious a point, but everything that you said is, much, much uh, worse in in the developing world. Um, and so uh, we don't, I totally agree that we don't talk enough about um, how there are, you know, millions of people who are not connected. We talk about all the dangers of our kids being online and all that, but we don't talk about the, the dangers of being left behind because we're not connected. Yeah. yeah, those are all phenomenal points. We need to be mindful of the distributional inequalities that this technology could even worsen. Uh, it would not be a good world in 20 years if the rich, only the rich got richer from this technology and those, you know, who have less were left behind. And how are we gonna stop the rich getting richer? Yeah. I mean, they seem to be so well, good at that. They can get richer, but not only the rich should get richer. Um, okay, let me throw this out to um, a student first, our first question, if there's a student in the audience. Okay, fabulous. Um, if we could. Um, this is perfect because this is actually right where I wanted to take my question. Um, it, it seems like at least in this country for the last 50 years, things have actually gotten more unequal. 
And we've, despite, you know, all these, well, it, different life expectancy things have actually changed and that's all complicated, but it's certainly from a purely economic perspective gotten more unequal over time and trying to the looking towards the more sort of utopian side of things like we're suggesting um, is going to require a reshift of how we think about ourselves and society and our place and our relationship to work and all those things. And it, it I, I just can't help but think about like, uh, Kevin McCarthy and uh, his debt ceiling negotiations is saying we're going to get rid of SNAP. We're going to we're going to ruin the SNAP benefits. That's all going to be out the window. And it seems like part of what we're dancing around here is, in fact, a restructuring of how wealth is distributed and how power is distributed. And we we can have this kind of conversation in the abstract, but the kind of political implications of that seem to be like we've kind of seen this coming for a long time. And yet we haven't actually acted on it before. And, you know, like the, the extended um, tax credits that were given out during COVID, like it seemed like we were on the verge of like a systemic shift. And then we went back. We're like, oh, no, 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 uh, this expired. Um, how do we take that momentum forward? Um, other than to be quite blunt, waiting for my grandfather to die. But beyond that, um, <laughs> What do we do? I'm probably the same age as your grandfather. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, w well, one clear answer is to get involved and vote yourself. Um, and I'm sure you do, but a lot of uh, people of the younger generation aren't as politically involved as they are. So, and you can get involved in community organizations or local government, things of that nature. I think that's really important. Um, or Lee, do you, you look like you're deep in thought there? Uh, um, I mean, this, these are really hard questions. Uh, it, it goes back to, you know, kind of the trajectory of history of what you believe is human progress and the nature of humans and, and our political system. And do we have a better political system than like imperfect democracies that are like capitalist democracies. Um, I mean, in a lot of ways, there's a lot of scary stuff going on in the world that um, is even worse than the rich getting richer, which is that there's a lot of uh, shifts away from democracies. Um, and that, that scares me a lot. So kind of, you know, again, these are, these are questions that go way beyond this question of where we are with generative AI and, and, you know, like technology, but I do, this is my optimist, you know, streak where I do think that we can leverage, we can harness technologies that we're developing right now to a shed light on the sources of inequality. Um, that's really important um, where we talked about like, and you talked about how you can detect discrimination. You can detect um, with large data sets, like patterns of disparities in benefits that are being given in, um, you know, infrastructure that's being um, just invested differently in different communities. Um, that's that's one thing, but but we can even more than that see the some of the root causes of some inequalities, like. Why is it that like college applications are skewed uh, or, you know, there's, there's disparities there? Um, is it like biases in the way that the application is set up? There's lots, lots of room for experimentation and I think we should embrace that. You know, how far does the um, inequities in, in investment go back and like how do, can we correct that? Um, and, and I think that really, again, we need to, keep this kind of sense that there is a lot that um, AI can actually do in tackling the world's most wicked problems. So environmental issues. I mean, we heard in this morning that it's it's like this double-edged sword, sword, of course, like they also take a lot of environmental, you know, like resources. And so we need to have this public conversation about, you know, like, what is the level of usage that 
is it's a cost benefit issue. Like, you know, we want to tackle um, some, some of the best um, solutions right now for climate change, for endangered species um, are really coming out of machine learning, like uh, to, you know, show how, how we can um, clean up the ocean. Like there's so many great programs like that are AI for good. Um, and we need to kind of look more meta and like, how do we look at all these AI for good functions and then also look at the cost of deploying them and have much more systemic analysis of, you know, what is the, what is the level that we, of accuracy that we're comfortable with, like, you know, um, level of progress that we're comfortable with. Um, in general, I do think, again, this is um, kind of my optimist. I, I do think that even though we, we have the sense that uh, equality or inequality has been deepening, that the, there's like a lot of divide in, the, in wealth or, or deepening of um, wealth distribution. We also see when you see kind of trajectories of human progress, we are um, seeing, you know, li li longer life expectancies, um, much more cures, much more accessibility to um, literacy and um, poverty alleviation. There, there is progress there to, to point to. Uh, and so this is just like, I think what we need to be beyond vo uh, voting, like people who care like you and, and so many in the room about these things, they, we really need that skin in the game of, we have the technologies, let's deploy them for good. That's, that's I think the best that we can do. Yeah, that's, that's great. Those are really thoughtful uh, points. Another, another question from the audience. Hey, this was this was a great panel. Thank you very much. Um, I had a question about what proposals or gestures that, uh, you know, reforms to public governance or corporate governance um, you guys are most excited about um, and would recommend. Um, and as a follow up, uh, do you think our current administrative and legislative and regulatory tools are sufficient to the task of you know taming AI? And in particular, earlier I know you mentioned the FTC. Um, there's nothing like a platform technology, if not uh, AI, that seems to, you know, involve everything, every type of, you know, commercial transaction we could possibly dream up of. Um, so I'm just curious if, if y'all are um, especially bright-eyed about uh, proposals on the horizon for that type of infusion of democratic participation, or at least control over this, uh, this new technology. Um, I mean, just one quick reaction. I said on the first panel, I, I think we need something like an Apollo program where we very quickly have a, a lot of government funding to get the brightest minds in the room from all different sides and all the different perspectives and start figuring out the ethics, the governance, all these things, because I think nobody knows right now. And we need to figure this out quickly and do it well. And we don't want just uh, passive, uh, a passive role in this and wind up down the wrong path. But I, I don't think anybody knows the answer to that, but I'll defer to the panel. So I'd say right now, no, we don't have the right regulations and the right governance. And, but again, like Harry said, it's not, it's not obvious what that should be. It's going to be really tricky and really hard to figure out how to, to regulate it without stifling it and how to encourage it's the widest possible accessibility. So let's form a panel and figure it out. <laughs> I, I really like th this idea of an Apollo like, project and you know, massive investment. Um, I, one thing that I, I think that we should think about and, and I worry about is the, too much of the lumping of the kind of governance of AI as like a one thing, like one topic, exactly what you said. Like there's lots of different industries. There's so many different applications and I don't, I'm not like a big fan of what the Biden administration did last year. Yeah, just late, late last year, um, which is just have like an AI bill of rights that to me is so abstract because it's trying to catch everything that it's doing nothing. 
Um, so, and the, the EU is similar, like it has the EU AI draft, which just kind of talks in the abstract, like if it's a high risk AI, if it's a, and I just, I have not found that very fruitful. So, so in some ways we, we need that Apollo, like massive, you know, like concentrated, like let's think about this new technology as, as some, a thing like that's unified. But in a lot of ways, we need every single agency to develop competencies to think about the applications in like the FDA, in the FTC, in the EOC, in um, you know, like OSHA, all these different, um, like I said before, agencies can actually really very much benefit from um, using these tools themselves and uh, providing guidance to uh, industry. And on that, I wanna say that you know, this is what is very frustrating that there's very little guidance to industry in a lot of things. So um, content moderation is a great example where we talk in very binary ways about like, you, you, you use the word governance, which I think is the right word to use. Um, a lot of times it's the use, the, the, the word that's, you know, we talk about regulation as like, let's either, you know, have this continued complete immunity on user generated content or repeal section 230 and you know like have liability um so liability shield or liability without everything in the middle of like how do you govern um things that are already done in the private industry so every single big you know platform does content moderation so governance real good governance um is is about finding the best practices, finding the standardization, um, collaborating with private industry and figuring out what works, what doesn't work. How do you differentiate between the snake oil? How do you create civil society that has these checks on the like profit sector of, I've envisioned in my work, um, similar to um, hackers kind of like that are professional like, third party kind of civil society that finds vulnerabilities like cybersecurity vulnerabilities. Let's have these like bias bounties of civil society that's finding all these like, like bad applications of AI and funding that and, and having a lot more rules about um, what needs to be disclosed, um, access to data, all these things. So that's, that's what I think about as governance. Great. Well, thank you so much. Uh, please join me in thanking this incredible panel for phenomenal discussion. Um, so we've had a full day. We heard a lot of different perspectives. I think we learned a lot, uh, but there's many more ideas to uncover and many more problems to solve. So uh, while we're all thinking about this, please join me in our dessert reception in the next room where we can continue the conversation. So thank you so much for coming.